We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got a question from Owlbear who writes, what are your thoughts on other game experience enhancing products? Sound, music for the ears, candles for the scent, game-related snacks? Well, thanks for the question, Owlbear. I hope the chicks are doing well. Now, this is a topic we've touched a bit on in the past. Uh, some parts of it we've actually discussed in some detail, but other parts not at all. Even for the stuff we've covered in the past, though, like sound at the table, it's been well over a year now at this point, so I think it's worth covering again. Now, I think the best way to cover this is to break down Owlbear's question to some different sections, so I do want to start with some overall thoughts on game enhancers or game night enhancers. And that's mainly that I am a huge fan of game experience enhancements of all kinds. I love anything that increases the feeling of immersion when playing a game. Now, this is true of both board games and RPGs. Things that help me forget I'm playing a game and instead make me feel like I'm having an experience are always positive to me. People set the mood with lights and surround sound for a movie. Some people are now even using the motion chairs and water squirting <laughs> setups in some theaters. Why should you expect any less from your game experience? Now, I bet we don't go so deep as to get into sensory chairs. I don't know if anyone's game room has gone that far yet or if that's even technology you can put in your home. But the thing is, and I think that might be an instance, is the caveat to all this about I, I love game enhancing experiences is that it can be taken too far. I love things that increase immersion but hate things that pull me out of the game. Things that remind me that I'm back in the real world sitting in a game room. So using game enhancing products I find is a balancing act. The key may be to make sure the game itself is still the focus, so you're still there to play a game, and the outside things that keep people focused on the game are good, and things that distract you from the game are bad. Just because you're walking through the bog of eternal stench in the game doesn't mean you need to really drive that experience home to your players outside of the game mechanic. Now, getting back to Owlbear's question, let's start breaking down this into sections. Up first, Owlbear mentions sound. All right, so this is the one we definitely uh, looked at before. We took a pretty deep dive into music and sound effects at the game table way back September 2018. Uh, that was literally episode eight of our podcast. And back then, I think we were doing, I was writing the article before and then doing the podcast, but like this is going way back. Um, now, I don't want to go into as much detail as we did then because we had a full episode on it and you're welcome to check that out. But I will say, uh, just to summarize, I will say that I think audio can be one of the best ways to enhance your game night. It can be a fantastic for enhancing role-playing games. And, and I actually really grew to love having background music or ambiance on in the background when playing board games. Those who check out some of our AP videos, like our Gloomhaven series, will often note audio in the background. Though, for those, we do need to be very cautious of copyright issues. Yeah, very true. Now, the one source of background music and audio I continue to return to, and this is one that I talked about back in 2018 and I still use, um, as Sean mentioned, during Gloomhaven. I use this every Gloomhaven live stream, and that is a website called Tabletop Audio. This site has all kinds of soundscapes covering pretty much every genre. Like you've got your Cthulhu, you've got your sci-fi, you've got space opera, you've got spaceports, you've got halfling kitchens, just a ton of different settings, pretty much everything you can imagine. Uh, and it all works just at a touch of a button. You can use the site 100% free or you can back their Patreon. And what that does is give you a wider variety of options. Almost every soundscape they have, they also have a Patreon version of which is just to give you more options. As far as I understand, it's not like it's better quality or more sounds and it just more options, basically doubles your options. And remember that if you're not streaming, you've got yeah. a huge range of options available to you. There's nothing wrong with using copyrighted music for a home game, mm -hmm. but it's just not allowed on videos. Yeah. I, I personally, I do like having, um, something like tabletop audio. So you're sticking away from license things. People will recognize, but we'll get into why in just a bit. Now, if you're just looking for sound effects, uh, another site, this is a, more an app, something you can download, something you can get on your phone or on desktop is a site called, or a, a program called Sirenscapes. Now, they can do ambience as well. 
And their ambiance is well done because it's a bunch of sliders. Like, how often do you want to hear chains and how often do you want screams and how often do you want the dripping water? So that's kind of neat. But personally, I find it's a little too much work where I'd rather just put on tabletop audio for the background. But what Sirenscape does well is sound effects that you can click buttons on. And the neat part is you can also use those same sliders and put them on repeat, right? So you can do like a sword swing and an orc grunt and put it on repeat. Now you have a battle against the orcs going on. And then when the wizard casts fireball, you click the little fireball button and you get a big whoosh sound, right? Uh, the drawback here is um, that you can get Sirenscape free, but you, there's, you don't want to, to be honest. Uh, you can basically get the generic fantasy, the generic sci-fi, or the generic board game, because yes, there is a Catan, Cyrus Escape, where every time someone trades in their wood for sheep, you can click a button to hear a ba or a sound of chopping wood. It does exist. I've got a copy of that one. Uh, but normally you have to buy uh, sets, and it's not a subscription model. It's you have to buy. So if you want the Space Voyage set, you pay for the Space Voyage set. If you want the fa Fantasy Chaos Battle set, you buy this Fantasy Chaos Battle set. Uh, so it's not... I, I kind of wish there was a one-time, just get access to everything, but as far as I know, there is not. Now, there are drawbacks to sound use as well, which we kind of hinted at. For one, it takes effort. Not only sourcing it, getting it ready to play, figuring out what goes where if you're setting up a soundboard and how you're going to use it and, and planning that out so you're not forgetting about it as you're going through whether it's the board game or, or your you know GM screen or whatever. Uh, and then on top of that, you need to make sure it's not too loud for the people right in front of you and too quiet for the people at the other end of the table. Uh, beyond that, one of the problems you run into is if you're running into a, an ambient sound of some sort, they all loop mm -hmm. at some point, right? There's, it's usually only a, a certain length of, mu of music that's played on. Now, if you're playing a four hour game of Gloomhaven and you've got one ambience track going, mm -hmm. people are probably going to notice, hey, wait a second, didn't we just hear that? Uh, you know, unless it's a long enough clip. So that's something, yeah. if you're going to be playing for a long time, either change up your ambient tracks, depending on mm -hmm. where you are in the game, or choose something that's got a long enough repeat time that you forget what it sounds like by the time yeah. you get, by the time it starts again. Now that is one place where Sirenscape is an advantage because it's procedurally generated background music. So it does not repeat. Yeah. So they do have that, but it does have a limited number of sounds. Like yeah. you're going to hear the same sounds, but they're not going to be in the same order. Uh, now again, so soundtracks are one of those things that we mentioned, you know, uh, if you're not running a stream, if you're not recording video, you can use copyrighted content for your own game use, you know, that yep. you own. So if you are storming the Mount Doom, to, Mount Doom and you're with your hobbits, you can play the soundtrack to uh, Lord of the Rings. But if everyone likes that movie or hates that movie or some people love <laughs> it and some people hate it, you're going to get people who are maybe triggered by that music and you're going to get discussions outside of the game involving regarding the movies or whatever content you're playing that can distract from what you really are trying to do, which is the game yeah. itself. And again, we don't want things that are distracting from that game. Uh, we want things that are going to help immerse you further in the game. Yeah. You don't want someone sitting there. Go, oh, I love this song. Right. Like that right then is going to pull you out of it or, oh, this is the part where the orcs sieged Mordor. And remember that scene? You don't want that to happen. Yeah, absolutely not. You want you want it to uh, again, you want it to be in the background, but not noticeable. Essentially, uh, the yeah. ideal I, the ideal ambient music is there. Um, it's it's sort of the concept of elevator music in the first place. The only problem with elevator music is there's nothing to distract you, whereas you should have a game going on in front of you that should be keeping people focused. <laughs> Um, right. not standing around with a, you know, you know, twiddling your fingers in an elevator. Fair enough. All right, moving on to scent. Now, this is one we have not covered before, but a game enhancing thing that I gotta admit, I am really curious about this. This is something, uh, since I first heard about it, I've, I've been, I don't know, obsessed isn't the right word because I haven't gone all the way and done it yet, but definitely I, I want to experience, I want to try this. I want to see more done with this. Because what I have done, I've done the basic thing, right? Where you you light some incense, whether that's before everyone shows up or in the middle, like I've had it where they're visiting the wizard in the wizard's tower. And I walk around the table while I'm playing, you know, Morgan Canaan. And at the time I light some incense and put it in there. And that definitely does work. Like it works. Like it, you get that impact. You get that I'm now in a wizard's thing because I smell weird scents in the room or uh, stuff like that. Now, 
I haven't gone beyond that, right? Like I've just done the the like I said the the very basic. I think I've used some lightly scented candles before too. Uh, but nowadays there are companies out there that produce tabletop scents, like actual gaming scents. And man, the options are crazy. Like you've got your Alchemist Lab, but you also have the you know horse dung for in the the um, stables, and you've got the the sewers for the, when you're going to fight those giant rats that don't exist down there. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, there's just fragrances and there's also candles. Now I haven't seen anything that's scentsy like, but I'm sure there are. Um, now I have checked these out at cons and like I've looked at them and they tend to come in little silver, uh, like not Petri dishes, but these, I don't know what you call them. Little silver containers where you screw the cap off and you can smell it. And they're like little rubbery beads. And, I, I don't know. Like they, they're neat. The smells are good or bad. Like they're they're appropriate. I guess is probably the first term. But I've never actually taken the plunge and bought any and brought any home because for one they're not cheap. Now this for one, personally to me seems cringy. But then I actually haven't experienced it, so I'm willing yeah. to have my mind changed if uh, if someone can give me the uh, the fun experience that it adds. Yeah. Now, now what people say, and I definitely know it's true. Like I, I I've experienced myself is it scent is the most, uh, the sense is most tied to memory and can have the most powerful emotional impact. Uh, just let me walk into the Windsor Pizza Bar or the, and and immediately I'll, you know, there's, there's certain memories that come back and there's definitely certain smells that, that just flood of memories come in, right? So I think making use of scent during a game is brilliant. Now, I don't know as much in a board game. To me, it's more of a role-playing experience to me than, than a board game. I don't know what I'd want to smell while playing a board game. I guess some farm smells while we're playing Catan is going to make me feel more immersed. I don't know. Most board games are so abstract. I, I think this is more of a role-playing thing. Uh, the problem, though, I've seen is any of the scents I've actually smelled at a con, you basically had to hold the thing under your nose, right? It wasn't enough to fill the room. So what would happen is whatever scene I'm describing in my role-playing game and trying to immerse everyone, and I suddenly have to pause and go, here, smell this, and have everyone pass around this little jar, which to me is going to completely break that sense of immersion. Now I'm sniffing a thing in front of me, and I'm no longer thinking about what my character is doing. This is similar to your audio problem, of making sure it's not too loud or too quiet for that entire group. Uh, you've got the same issue. Yeah. Now the other problem is, I was thinking about this, if you did fill the room, so... You go into the banquet hall and you fill the room with these awesome scents of food. And then while you move to the sewer and then like, how do you get rid of the food smell? Cause now you got food and sewer smell. And then you go to the wizard's lab and now the wizard's lab smells like Turkey and sewer and incense. Like I, I just, I, I, I can't like, it's just, how do you get rid of the scent? If you are going to fill a room, like the two are going to overlap and probably do some interesting things. Now, what I would like, think I would do, if I was going to actually use scents is I would save it for a pivotal scene and I would pick one scent, like one, here's my, my big boom. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this on the table. Everyone's going to do it. And well, actually under the table, what I'd like to do is my big boardroom table is, you know, un, uncap something under the table and then it would slowly fill the room. And I think that'd be great. Like something the players would pick up almost subconsciously at first and notice as the scene goes on. I, I don't know. I, like until someone comes up with a scent solution, I can do that too which isn't pass around this thing or light this votive candle and wait until it gets the effect. I think this is going to be more of a neat gimmick for most people. That said, if any companies out there are looking for someone to do a review of your products, I would love to try out some scents at my tables. I'm just not willing to make that initial money investment because I just, it seems like a gimmick to me. I'd love to be proven wrong though. Well, now I know in the special effects world for live entertainment, there are absolutely solutions out there but they're probably going to be overkill for most game rooms. And unfortunately they run a little pricey. That being said for about $60 Canadian, you can rent a machine that will solve your scent dispersion problems, which sounds amazing. And now let me tell you, you can get anything as a scent from rotting human flesh to any flower you want or garden Valley. If you want to set a scene, they have, or can make a scent for it. The problem is that scent costs you $300. Uh, now that's not a one use scent. You can seal them up in a, and, and, and reuse them. So you could buy some for a campaign, but you still have to be pretty heavily invested in order to do that. But again, the technology is there. 
if you can afford I don't know. it. Okay, when, when I saw the ones I saw were expensive, I wasn't talking $300 <laughs> expensive. Uh, maybe you can look up actual prices, but if I remember, it was in the, in, the, in the double digits, but not the triple digits. So if people are interested in checking out Sense, um, the one company that seems to have made it, because you know, for a little while, it was like a bunch of these showed up at once and you know, uh, cream roast of the crop adventure sense is the one that seemed to uh, have done the best. Uh, they tried to launch on their own. Then they did a Kickstarter to increase the range of sense. That's the one I I've actually smelled myself and I've, I've held, I've touched. Um, and I've been curious to bring home, uh, another one is cantrip candles. Those are the ones that are doing the whole scented candle thing. And another one is dungeon sense, which this one caught my eye cause they do the tins, but they also do like votives. And I wonder if like a large votive would work better, especially if you could just like put it in the center of the table and not tell the group that it's going to produce scent. Like it's just, here's our centerpiece. You know, we light a candle for our game session. And then all of a sudden you start to notice whatever it is. Now, again, I have not tried any of these. I am curious to try any of these, but I haven't tried them myself. So these aren't like strong recommendations. This is what I've seen that's out there. Yeah. I mean, Adventure Sense for $15, you get a tin that they claim if you open it up, will fill the room quickly and dissipate if you close it up again. Uh, they're just little scent scentsy bead type things, but there's no, yeah. there's no heating or anything necessary. It's literally right. you just open it up and close it for 15 bucks. Um, and, and apparently they will do custom scents as well. So, you know, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's worth it. I said, hey, Adventure Sense, if you're listening, though I'd be <laughs> really surprised if they were. Also, now, while it may go without saying, check with your players for sensitivities and be extra careful if you're using open flames or candles. Character sheets are very flammable. Yeah. Plus, I'm sure lots of other stuff in your game room probably is as well. Yeah. All right, next, we move on to taste. Now, personally, I found this part of the question a bit ironic. Uh, just because two days ago, Al Jam, a friend I have on Facebook, someone I interact with all the time from Cleveland, Ohio. We were supposed to meet up at Origins this year for the first time. I'm sad that's not going to happen. Anyway, he sent me a link to a company that is selling RPG branded or related beef jerky, or sorry, jerky, I shouldn't say beef jerky, called Mythical Meats. Uh, I actually tried to order the sampler pack, but unfortunately they don't ship to Canada. Uh, this sampler pack included things like unicorn and Phoenix meat for your trail rations, uh, which was smoked beef and beef and pheasant respectively. Because unicorns are endangered folks. And we do not support the slaughter of endangered and mythical creatures. Not even if it makes your game more tasty. Yes, even though the unicorns have returned to the plains of Africa, now that humans aren't out there, we still got to be careful not to overpoach. Having gaming-related food at the game night is something that, for me, goes back years. Like, I've always enjoyed tying food to my gaming, though, interestingly, I don't like to play and eat at exactly the same time. More about that in a minute. But back in the old University of Windsor days, when I was part of the Windsor Gaming Society, I remember going with my friend Eugene and going to either Lowe's or Loblaws, whatever grocery store he worked at, and buying this, like, giant summer sausage. Like, this thing was, I don't know, three feet long and, like, half a thick foot thick and getting this and because we were going to play this massive warhammer campaign where they were on the road and eating rations all the time and he brought off uh, like this fancy conan knife with him and we were like cutting off chunks of the summer sausage and eating it while playing warhammer because that's obviously that's what our characters ate with summer sausage so to be fair we <laughs> had a lot during in those days during gaming yeah. it was just that taco bell wasn't on theme with the games except i don't know maybe cyberpunk yeah, I don't think I don't think any of our games were tied well to the Big Bite hot dog from uh, 7-Eleven, though I think Jolt was pretty close to Bouncy Bubbly Beverage from uh, Paranoia, or at least Happy Fun, if nothing else. <laughs> now, the thing with food at game night is making sure you're following game night food etiquette. Now, this is a topic we covered uh, quite some time ago again, back in January 2019. Now, the main point we tried to make back then, and again, I will reiterate now, is that you need to make sure you're protecting the games while you're eating. Now, this can be done by separating the snacking and eating from the games, by eating before or after taking a eating break instead of playing while you're eating, which is actually my preferred method, uh, but also making sure to avoid greasy, sticky, powdery foods, as well as making sure your games themselves are protected for when the inevitable Dorito fingers do get to your cards by doing things like sleeping. And once more, watch out for allergies. Your mermaid adventure could be brought up short if one of your players badly reacts to the shell shellfish. Yes, you don't want to play that one out at the table. 
Now, one thing I really enjoy doing that can help with immersion is to tie the food you're eating to the game. So, for example, you are playing a fantasy game and you're at the local tavern putting out some kind of charcuterie board covered in meats, dried breads, and cheeses can be a great touch. Now, personally, um, I subscribe to something called the Carnivore Club. Now, this is a monthly source of meat where they send you dried, cured, seasoned meats, uh, the type you'd have on a charcuterie board, that I think are great to represent rations or a medieval tavern fare. Now, if you're playing something Asian, say, or Japanese-themed, like Legend of the Five Rings, maybe it's time to serve some ramen. Now, if you're going to go with pot noodles, you know, you're, you're just Mr. Noodles, at least add some ramen eggs or two. Uh, we'll drop a link to the recipe for those. And yes, I know, it's anachronistic. Ramen was only invented in Japan 100 years ago. But you know what? Legend of the Five Rings fantasy anyway. So I just love ramen. So if I have an excuse to eat ramen, I'm going to go with it. Now, a couple things to keep in mind with food. Uh, make sure you have enough, right? Uh, you don't want to be the, the person who's like, maybe if you got your own, like, you know, pepperoni sticks or something as a snack, that's a little different. But if you're going to do the whole, make an event, right? Make sure there's enough food for everyone. And watch for dietary preferences and restrictions. You don't want to show up with too little food for everyone to take part. And you want to make sure that everyone has something present that they can and will eat. Now, one sense that Albert didn't mention is sight. And enhancing yeah. game night immersion through lighting is something that Mo has been experimenting with for a few night years now with mis mixed success. Yeah, this is like, I love the idea. The first time, I don't remember where it was. It was back, uh, I think it was before G+. It was a blog post. I think it was on the old Grog Nordia uh, blog, which is one of the best role-playing blogs that's ever existed. Sadly, now done. Uh, the writer has stopped writing. And that was to use lighting during your games using uh, programmable lights. At the time, Philips Hue was what I owned. Like, can you imagine when your group goes underwater to visit the Mer King and all of a sudden the lights start shifting between blues and greens? Or I've done it where I'll have the room suddenly go dark and then they begin to flicker on and off. Or one of my favorite scenes I ever did was there was a goblin, a mad goblin druid or shaman in Warhammer uh, fantasy role play who was casting spells and every time he cast a spell I turned the lights all green now these were really cool but you know what most of the time they took players out of the game instead of immersing them further uh, as with any of these things distraction can be a problem yeah see the problems I've found with fiddling with lighting is for one it's not easy to do on the fly it wasn't something I could just have timed and happen. I had to grab my phone. I had to open the appropriate app. I had to load the appropriate scene. I had to start the appropriate scene. And the other thing is I never found anything, at least for the Philips Hue, and I tried a slew of different apps that was good for quickly switching between scenes or more importantly, just going back to normal lights, which leads me to the biggest problem we had is that when the lights are off or flashing or shifting between blues and greens, it's really hard to see your game components, whether that's your hand of cards in a, in a, in a board game, seeing the board pieces or reading your character sheet. Yeah, there are a lot of control options out there. I actually have one button touch control of my overhead lights here in the office. I have been playing with them a bit, but because of the, the front light on me, it, it's pretty hard to see. I'd have to turn them down because it's not a bright uh, it's not a right. bright lighting system I have in here, but it wasn't easy. And my solution ended up using a stream deck connected to a computer program, connected to the wireless hub, connected to the wireless lights. Wow. Yeah. And see, it just, yeah, it's great, but I don't want to set that up again to go through for the, for a game. I'd have to rebuild, you know, build all those scenes and it would be just as difficult as building up that yeah. soundboard for, you know, the sound portion. Yeah, see, I, I had really high hopes. Like I had spent, I, buy, I bought the high end. I bought the Philips Hue, which is the, 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 the big name brand version. And I got to admit, nowadays, I almost never use it for doing anything cool. Uh, now, I will use it for that special encounter, right? That epic battle, the center of the board, you're about to take over Mechatol Rex, whatever it happens to be, the big boss fight. Uh, but then I just, I make sure I only have the one scene set up and it's ready to go, it's ready to play, and I just hit the thing on my phone and it goes and it works. But anything more complicated than that is just too much work. Now, as an example of this, in Star Wars Edge of the Empire, 
there was a particular scene where the players were trying to take off on a ship and all kinds of malfunctions were going wrong. So for one, there was a horrible smell. And here's where I would have loved the table sense. There was a klaxon going off and there were bright flashing red lights. And the point was the players were supposed to be freaking out and stressing out and not being able to see their character sheets at that time was perfect. That just immersed it even more. And they had to deal with the ship that wasn't working for them. So it was awesome for that. But then I didn't use it again for the rest of the Star Wars campaign because it just nothing else came. But that particular scene went great. So it's got to be really limited. Now, unfortunately, while the concept of the hue and similar systems is fantastic and their potential is remarkable, lighting control is a bit harder than most people expect sometimes. Yeah. I've literally made a career of controlling lighting for events and yeah. shows and things. So, you know. It, it's not something that people should necessarily expect to be able to make wow magic happen out of the box. Yeah. yeah. When I, when I read about how it worked compared to the actuality and it just didn't live up now, what might work? And I was just thinking about this. Now I'm going off, off our notes here is if you had a stage director, if you were DMing and you had someone else that all their job was is to do the immersion stuff, I bet you it would work. With the sense and everything. Yep. Like if you had, like I said, basically a stage director who was sitting there with a laptop, with the hue open, with a stream deck and everything else, it would probably work. So you could probably make for a fantastic con game yep. or, or special event. But like while trying to DM a game and run all the NPCs and move the minis on the map and like, or you're playing a board game, no one's going to want you to do that when it's your turn, yep. right? Like you're playing Terraforming Mars and you got the Terraforming Mars soundtrack on and you got the shifting red lights going on and then you're like, oh, I got to switch the soundtrack before it repeats. And no, just take your dang turn, right? Like yeah. you don't want it to interfere there. Yeah, no, it, it realistically, I mean, uh, if you look at something like... Um, uh, some of the, some of the streams online, you know, some of the big, the big D and D streams, you know, yeah. they have a producer behind the scenes, you know, they have someone who's doing a lot of the camera switching and stuff like that. And that's no different than what you almost, yeah. you need for, you know, any of these, you know, effects, you know, they're at, at a show, there is someone in charge of special effects and someone in charge of lighting mm -hmm. and someone in charge of audio and someone in charge of video, uh, because you know, the band leader doesn't want to have to do all that stuff. Exactly. Now, what I will say, I do appreciate having my program over lighting, and I do like that. And that is just for making things easier to see when playing games in general. Uh, in particular with the Hue, there are two settings. One is focus, the other is concentrate. And I find both of those really good for board games that have pieces that are close in color or games with small text. What these settings do is they enhance the contrast of everything in the room. For example... I can't play Raiders of the North Sea without like with just standard lighting on because I cannot tell the gray meeples from the black meeples. I have literally had to pick them up, held them both my hand and go, okay, yeah, that's a gray or black. Whereas if I set my lighting to concentrate, I can tell them apart from across the table. So that is the one thing where I do really appreciate still having my lights. Yeah. And this is where Hugh shines. It's the, those small adjustments that you can make between games to go over the long haul uh, rather than, you know, some bleep, brief flashy stuff. Yeah. All right. So at this point we've covered scent, taste, hearing, and sight. So the only scent we're missing is touch. Now we're not going to deep dive this one, but just thinking about touch, I couldn't help but think of a game that came out in 2018 that I just, I, I think is groundbreaking in a way, a very unique, and it's called Nyctophobia. Uh, this is a cooperative murder mystery where you're basically, um, you know, Jason's trying to catch you while you're out the lake. And it does something really interesting with touch because what happens is players wear blackout glasses and cannot see the board and then have to rely on touch to navigate their way through the camp to try to escape. And then there is also a two player version where there's a vampire hunter, there's a vampire chasing you and you have to escape. And I'm, I want to try this game. This is something I was looking forward to seeing at origins this year. And unfortunately without going, I'm not going to get to see it. It's not something I plan on buying on my own just cause I'm like, it's so out there, but just a game that is literally based on, on not being able to see and relying only on touch to be able to play. And then thinking about that, I was got a flashback to a couple games my kids had. One that we brought up many times on the show, which is Laundry Jumble. Now, this was a kid's game, a preschooler game, where the kids had to reach into this, like, fabric uh, laundry 
washing machine, sorry, that's the word, washing machine, and pull out the appropriate piece of laundry. And all the different pieces had different textures. And of course, there were some similar textures, so it was kind of hard to tell. And that's another one where it relied on touch. And then another was Master Fox. Master Fox has you take a box and you put on a, a blindfold, which makes you look like a fox. And then you have to try to find the appropriate meeple. But the thing is, you might have to find, like, say, the hedgehog, which is, of course, spiky. But the snake's also spiky because it's in a zigzag pattern. So it's trying to figure out the exact meeple to pick up. And I just thought it was really neat to see board games that are so focused on touch as, as a thing. And it's not definitely not common. Like, Nitophobia is, like, blows my mind as a modern hobby board game using it. Whereas the kids games are just trying to differentiate between, you know, spiky, soft and crinkly, which I thought was pretty cool. And then of course, uh, people have been adding the element of touch to their RPGs for years, in my opinion, uh, through creating props, right? Like who hasn't touched a tea soaked piece of paper that's supposed to represent the puzzle map or been handled a puzzle box, or, you know, here's your, uh, costume jewelry or your plastic gems to represent your money your metal coins and all those things that add a tactile feel to your role-playing games so for those of us who have watched dune we may not be interested <laughs> in those games where you're blindly reaching out and touching things <laughs> that's true you could always do the rpg thing the halloween thing too I've, I've yet to see anyone do it in an rpg but i could totally see the you know put your hand in here oh that's orc guts you know like there's a, I definitely remember going to those haunted houses as a kid where you did that thing with a yeah, I, put your hand in the blind. See, I saw, I saw, I saw uh, Dune pretty early because even at the, uh, at the Toronto Science Center, I wouldn't put my hand into boxes. I couldn't see <laughs> into. I've never been, I've never done it. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for our thoughts on game experience enhancing products for tonight. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add. Uh, so, uh, Angie Games is mentioning post pandemic, uh, she's going to start bringing you blindfolded to Windsor restaurants to see if you can tell the location by the scent. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. There's certain ones. I'm pretty sure I could. There's certain ones. Like I remember the smell of the old Sam's and the new Sam's does not have that smell. And walking in there, I get the memory of the absence of that smell. Right. Like I just walk in and I'm like, no, this doesn't smell like Sam's. And every time I go in there, it still doesn't smell like Sam's because that place had that flour pizza plate. Like, yep, yep. You could definitely smell the flour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was that, that, was that a, sort a of cooking of flour uh, scent. Yeah, um, there was, there was a, a flour scent. And apparently, uh, is saying that there is a vampire hunter re-theme of Nyctophobia. Yeah, that's the, like I said, the two-player version. It's a slightly cheaper version. Now, both of those games were released as Target exclusives, which is one of the reasons I haven't gotten a chance to see them. Because, well, no one local, there's no Targets here in Canada. So yep. we didn't get to check that game out. I want to play that one. I want to try it. Now, I see Deanna asking, would you bring your own lighting to a con game? Uh, yeah. I, I guess you could. <laughs> I mean, I would, but that's because I do that um, the problem is if you're doing that you need a private room like you're not yeah. going to do that in the hall filled with 20 rpg tables and they just put yeah, some no. spotlights on your table no you, you definitely have to have your your room this would be that'd be something you'd be considering more for your larp type experiences yeah. uh you know if you're trying that new larp uh the, the save the world one aliens invasion sort of thing that that happens yeah, at breakout yeah. um definitely that and, and sense especially yes you could not use sense in a crowded gaming hall uh well you, you could do the pass it around thing but uh, i personally don't think that's that cool yeah i mean because <laughs> i get you know adventure sense has those sachets where you can you can yeah. just patch the pass the little pillows around but uh yeah that's that's so once, once you're passing something around now it's not increasing immersion it's going to be a neat thing it's like oh i can smell the wizard's lab it's neat it'd be a neat gimmick but that's not going to increase my immersion yeah no absolutely. whereas if i'm sitting there and they like said the dm lights a candle in the room and then slowly you get that whatever that that acrid you know there's there's spices in the air smell yep. that i think would work right yeah, it's really, realistically, I mean, a lot of what we're talking here is very involved. So you've got two choices. You can add this to your game prep. So you can, while you're prepping your adventure, prep a soundboard and prep yeah. your hue scenes and the control system for that and you know, figure out that control system in advance. But you're talking about, you know, doubling your adventure prep time. Uh, at least and if you've got the time for that that's great 
Um, and I say doubling, it, it, yeah, it's going to be more the first time, but once you've got a system like anything else, you'll probably be able to, you know, adjust it for, uh, for each different adventure more quickly. But yeah, that first time is going to be tough. I don't know. Like the, I, the more I think about it, I'm like, you know where this would be good is nowadays more and more people are paying for an RPG experience. Yep. And I think if I did say, start running games in my basement and charging people to play, I might go through this extra work, but that would be a very prepped game, especially if I was running, like I, I wouldn't be improv much. I would make sure it's well scripted and everything else. Right. Because I need to make sure that they're having a good time, right? Like I, I'd, I'd be trying to get it all be worked in, right? Yeah. I, I'm not going to show up to someone's paying. I don't even know what people pay for these things, but someone's paying to play in my basement. I'm going to do a, probably a pretty railroady scripted adventure that I expect to be fun versus, all right, what do you guys want to do tonight? Right. Or you folk want to yeah. do tonight. So in that case, I would have the time for that prep and I think it'd be worth it. Right. Like I, I think prepared properly, except the hue. Like I, every time I tried to do anything cool to you, I fought with it. Yeah. Like every time, like whether it was the app or it wouldn't connect, the bridge wouldn't connect or I'd switch the scene and it didn't switch. And like, there is an app out there that I thought was fantastic. And this is one of the ones that was recommended when I bought the hue where it listens to your speaker and the louder you get, the brighter the lights get. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. So I did this thing where I was playing a goblin and the louder I got, the more green it got, except there was lag. Right. So it just didn't work, right? Yeah. Just with that little bit of lag, I'm like, you're not getting the effect. I'm like, yeah, green's going up and down in the room. So I kind of got that impact, but I didn't have the more upset the goblin got, the more green the room got, which is the effect I wanted. Yeah. So I'm actually using, uh, my solution has been uh, Hutro, H-U-E-T-R-O for Hue, which is a Windows store app. Um, okay. And and that's, that's what I've been using to control it. I can't. I'm and then sure. it turned out it was easy enough to link that in to uh, some control uh, functions on, on the stream deck. Right. Um, but again, you know, not everyone has, uh, you know, $150 stream deck and yeah. not all of the functions of Hutro are, I'm only using the free functions, but if you want yes. some of the more effecty ones, if you want to get into the, the flashy mm -hmm. disco stuff. Well, that was it too. Yeah, yeah, that's that. those all cost, right? And for I, some reason, they are not cheap. They are not app priced. Right, yeah. yeah. They, they are not, like I can get full board games for way cheaper than some <laughs> of these Hue apps. Yeah. And I'm like, come on. And, and not, there's no demo, so you can't tell what they could do. So I did, the, the best one I found at the time, and I have no clue, this was on Apple though, was Houdini. And that, let, I actually paid for that. And that let me do multiple scenes, but it was really bad for switching scenes because you literally had to go into your current scene and tell it to stop before you started the next one or they would overlap. Okay. And they would both be running and trying to take over your lights. So you would have to go into the one and stop it. Then you would have to open up the other one and hit play, which is just enough time that you're now taking everyone out of the game. Right. Right. Like it's, it's that. And then there's that moment in between where the lights are off. Yeah. So like you just, you don't get the transition. And that was one of the best apps I had. And I'm like, again, it's great. And like, I could, you could set up strobes, you could set up cycles, you could set up all kinds of really neat stuff. And I did, that's where I, I did my goblin chanting thing. I had one where there was a thunderstorm and it, I made it so different lights would flicker at different times, but there was always one on. So the players could always see. Right. And it worked, it worked great, but I had to program that in Houdini. Right. And, and again, if I wanted to switch something else, it was garbage. But if I just put that on, I'm like, here, you're in a storm. Well, I've and that had to do with players escaping a burning building in a thunderstorm, which is a Warhammer adventure. Many people have probably played rough night at the three feathers. So yeah, I have to say, uh, the Hutro it's, uh, I think it's six bucks Canadian for the, for the premium, yeah, uh, which that's... isn't horrible. Um, again, I only right now want single color stuff. I don't, you know, yeah. if I want to flash, I'll set up a bunch of different buttons on my thing and manually hit the buttons. Uh, yeah. but it's not something I want. It's, you know, I, I use it for lighting. I use it to enhance the green screen. If we're doing, if we're doing some yep. gaming stuff, um, you know, it makes the green screen pop a little better on camera. And, and well, that's it. That's where it's really good for. Like I am using a hue light right now that I turned down the, the yellow a bit to get more white. And that way it's got that. Yeah. I, I look so much better than three weeks ago <laughs> now that I've moved that and adjusted it and remembered to put it up on like at the beginning of the show. Right. Like, I don't even know if we can, if I can, if, if I can get this to, to, to show, um, well, it doesn't matter yeah, for but, yeah. the podcast anyway. It's uh, you know, there's, 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 there's light, but yeah, it's, it's so dim against all my uh, broadcast lights that you can't even really notice. 
Like I say, if you if you read our original, I think it's our tech on the table article. I really like praise the hue lighting, and just over time, I I no longer praise it as much. Plus, I have two bulbs that are already dead, yeah. and it hasn't been that long. Yeah, like they're supposed to last like a ridiculous number of hours, and they are not. So uh, what I'm actually doing, and and one thing one thing I've done to to get around some of the problems you've run into with bulbs is I'm actually using LED strip. So I'm actually right. using the the flexible strip lighting. Um, and it's not hue actually, uh, but I've got a yeah. hue gateway that brings it into the hue family. Uh, again, I, D I, I did a bunch of DIY stuff sort of to, to make it work. Um, and I found that stuff is pretty tough to, to beat up and I expect it to last longer than the really expensive hue bulbs, even though they're really expensive. Yeah. The hue, I'm, I'm disappointed that they're back there there's two yeah. those two hue bulbs are toast one of them doesn't show yellows like so it's only part of the leds are dead right and the other one flickers and so now i just put standard led bulbs over now that's over by my tv so i can still technically do all the game room stuff right but... plus they're not bright is the other problem i have with them like as you can tell from this one when you were here when we were playing with the blooms they just don't produce enough light like it's not even enough to reflect off the ceiling yeah i know they're just well, the Don't bloom, the bloom uh, especially are, are designed for yeah. that morning wake up type sort of scenario. Well, they're supposed to also do like room, like, hey, this corner of my room's red and this corner is blue. Right. And I was hoping it would more fill my game room with greens and blues when we're underwater. And I find they, they just, I almost wish I never bought them. Like they're just, the, yeah. the bulbs give so much more brightness that I'd rather just sit a bulb out on the <laughs> table somehow. Yeah. All right. All right. We got anything else in the lobby? I don't see too much. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome, Poncho. I think that's. Uh... I I hope I run a pretty good game. I try, <laughs> try to make my games immersive. All right. Finally, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.